it's really great to be here. Um, I wish I were there in person, hopefully next time. And um, I will be sharing my screen. Um, what I will want to talk about today is about work that we've been doing in my lab or the intersection of natural language processing and computational social sciences. Um, and the main um, idea here really has to do with what we've been doing uh, traditionally in natural language processing um, is primarily dealing with words. And as you've been hearing in some of the talks today um, and also um, in a lot of the work that's happening these days, uh, there has been really a lot of progress. And so we know now how to um, handle individual words, for instance. We know how to create um, word representations, word embeddings for words like sun, um, so that we can compute with words, we can find which words are most similar or dissimilar. And um, within a language, across languages, we know how to identify relations between words. If we take read and paper, figure out what are the relations uh, between those words. Um, even at um, higher scope, for instance, entire sentences, she is a bright girl, figuring out the relations that words have um, among themselves, create sentence representations, uh, at also paragraph level, document level, and so forth. So this is primarily what we've been um, doing in computational linguistics. Now, on the other side, behind this language and also primary users of the language would be people. Um, and there is a lot to explore about people. Um, what are their opinions, views, values, and so forth. And by and large, this has been the purview of social sciences. So the point that I want to send out um, across today that there is a strong connection between these two fields um, going both ways. We can leverage what we know how to do in computational linguistics to learn more about people. And this has, there is a direction that has been explored um, in recent years uh, for quite a bit. Um, and also there is a connection going the other way Acknowledging there are people behind the data, we can eventually build better computational linguistic models. Um, and today I want to primarily focus on this second direction on how we can create representations and eventually downstream applications that are more um, aware of the people behind the language. And I'll go to um, a couple of projects that we've been working on in, in my lab and then just give a teaser at the end for a possible downstream application. So the first question that we ask is whether we can build language representation that accounts for cross-cultural differences. So acknowledging that there are people in different groups um, which may hold different beliefs, um, have different life experiences, um, how can we go about creating representation that would account for that? So normally I would get um, input from people live, um, given the setting, I'll just ask you if you could please think of what is that this word brings to mind. So if you think just about the first word that comes to mind, typical answers would be dog, animal, mouse. Um, so it's things that would surround cat in general or around a, um, the, the animal kingdom. Now, if you think about this word, so if I tell you sleep, again, what is the first word that comes to mind? And here, what we generally see is that there is more diversity across the answers. Um, and this is in fact, one of the prompts that was used in a study by um, two psychologists about a hundred years ago, uh, Kent and Rosanoff, who used a hundred emotionally neutral stimulus words including sleep and a number of others, and found that there was um, difference across genders and across groups with more agreement within um, age groups and within genders. So for instance, the word you've seen before, sleep, um, the younger group would have as a predominant answer dream, um, and the less young group had a predominant answer awake. 
or for food, for instance, the younger group would mostly respond with eating, um, whereas the less young group would mostly respond with drinking. So in one study, what we've done, we first replicated this study because we didn't have access to a digital format of the data, um, and then also augmenting their data. So we had 300 word as prompt, and then we use Mechanical Turk to collect um, responses using doing pretty much what you've done here as an exercise, given a prompt, what is the first word that comes to mind? Um, the other thing that we've done, we also wanted to collect demographic information. So we ran this study both in India and United States, um, and we collected 400 responses for each of these two culture groups. Uh, we had the World Association survey. Uh, we also had some spam check questions um, to make sure that we were getting genuine answers. And we had um, demographic questions. So in addition to country, which was selected by how we ran the study, we also asked about gender, age, location, occupation, ethnicity, education, and income. So all in all, this gave us more than 200,000 responses with 750 responses per word after removing spam. Um, we also balanced over quarters, uh, which gave us a total of 450 responses per word, which are balanced, like equal number, male, female contributors, equal number of US India contributors. And here is an example that came from our data, for instance, for the word bad as a prompt. And again, you can think as an exercise, what is the first word that comes to mind? We had the, of course, a variety of responses, but we see dominant responses from different groups. So the dominant response from male uh, respondents from um, US was water, uh, male respondents from India, again, water. Um, then female respondents from India, soap, and female respondents from US, bubble. So you see there are different responses for, uh, for different groups. Similarly, when we run other prompts, um, expect as a prompt, dominant response for male is nothing, for female is baby, um, for course would be golf and study respectively for male, female respondents. Um, admit, dominant response in India would give us hospital, um, in US guilt, or for comment, we'll get Facebook and say. Now, one thing that we've done first to see um, what, how, whether our hypothesis would hold, or also the Kent Rosan of hypothesis still holds on our data, we looked at um, statistics on the data set that we collected. Um, we see there is more diversity in India with a larger number of responses uh, compared to US. We didn't see much uh, difference in diversity of responses between male and female. Um, now looking within a group or across groups, so what you see um, in, in within a group, so if we take a respondent from India and then we see to what extent that respondent agrees with responses from other people from um, India, we will see a higher agreement. So that's the top table on the right. We'll see higher agreement within the group than across groups. Uh, whether we take just one response or we take top 10 responses from the group, um, which confirms that hypothesis that there is more agreement um, within, the, within the group in terms of how these word associations are made. So now to see to what extent we can create models that would replicate that, which is our goal to create these models um, that would be more aware of the people behind the language. We use data collected from um, Google Blogger covering a range of years. So we don't zoom in on a particular event in a certain year. So it's balanced over time. Um, we have uh, millions of tokens drawing from the different groups that um, we are exploring here. So India, US, male and female. And we explore a fairly simple idea, uh, primarily building on top of the um, skip gram model, which given a word, we'll try to predict the context and we train a neural network based on that. Um, the difference, however, in how we do it is that we label the words. So rather than just saying that a word is, for instance, sun or oil, we'll say it is oil, for instance, but we also give it a label. So there will be oil that was 
spoken by someone in India or spoken by someone in US. So now we have the words themselves and also words that are labeled with the demographic of the group um, who stated that in the data, um, which essentially will allow us to create representations that are specifically for that demographic. And we also have another um, variation of this model where we do the same for the words in the context, we would label them with the, with the group. So what we see is um, in terms of results, we see that we do better than a model that does not account for that. So we have a model that would create word representation. Traditionally, this uh, word association uh, task has fairly low measures. You can imagine if you have this game with a friend, what is the first word that comes to mind, how often those two would agree. So traditionally, these numbers are low. The first row would tell you if we were to use word embeddings, but in um, without having anything that's aware um, of the people behind the language compared to the models that we introduce, which again are fairly simple, but would account for the people behind the, uh, behind the language. Um, and similarly for culture, we see improvements uh, primarily for India, um, not so much for, for US, but we see there is a difference uh, by doing it this way. So now the next question that we ask is, here in this first study, we did it one dimension at a time. So considering, for instance, um, location or um, gender. Uh, but if we want to model more than one dimension, how should we go about that? And this is what um, we explore in this next study, uh, where again, we are going after the same idea that words would have different meaning for different users, presumably even for individual users. And here is, example of the use of the word health um, and how different um, users would have different nearest neighbors. And in terms of alternatives that we have, we could consider the language that the user has and create a lang user specific language model, or we could consider um, attributes that that user has, which would eventually allow us to go and build language representation that are specific to those attributes. For instance, um, female user from India would get date, would get representation for those attributes. Uh, we rule out the user writing uh, because it's not often that we find a lot of such data. It's also privacy invading. Um, so going after user attributes, we're asking the question to what extent we can create a language model that would be more akin to that particular user and would more be more reflective, more predictive of that uh, of that user. Again, without use, using any data specific to the user. Um, so here we use data from Reddit. Um, we have sixty-two thousand users for uh, whom we identify demographics uh, using patterns. Like for instance, I am blank years old, which will give us information on age, religion gender, occupation, and location. And we explore two ways of learning these people-aware embeddings. In one, we create a typical word embeddings, and then we also group together uh, people data from people who have certain attributes. For instance, we could have um, people who are labeled as young or from UK or from Canada and grouping them together, we can create these embeddings that are specific for the group and then append those to the word. So this will give us a word plus a group specific embedding. Or the alternative would be to learn everything in one shot. Um, this is inspired by work from Baman and colleagues. So we have a neural network that's now, um, now has additional weight matrices. So in, we, were, we learned the representation for the word as is typically done, but in addition for words that have certain properties, like say for instance, a word that was uttered by someone in the young group will also be passed to this um, other part of the network. 
for someone who's in the UK group will be passed through another part of the network and so forth. So in one shot, we learn both the word embeddings as well as um, representation for words as uttered by different groups. And we see to what extent this works through language modeling. Um, I, here we, um, we see perplexity. So perplexity is a reminder, the lower the better would tell us to what extent we can make predictions in a, in a language model. But we have the baseline, uh, which is using a recent uh, language model by Merit and colleagues. And we see if we use, I'll focus on sort of our best representation, which is aware of the people behind the language, these demographic matrices that significantly decreases the perplexity. So this is the general result. And here you can also see for different groups. Um, so orange would show us with demographic embeddings for male, female, or those with unknown gender, um, younger, older, or those who did not report on their age, um, different locations, um, Again, we see um, how we always get improvements from the use of demographic embeddings. Um, here is religion split. Um, interestingly, those who do not report anything on religion benefit the most. So this would be this last column and generally see across um, improvements. Now going back to the data that I introduced previously, which has uh, a word and then um, the first word that comes to mind from different groups, now zooming in on those groups that were used at, um, in that study, so India and US, we see the results that I was um, showing previously um, and how with this composite word embeddings, we can significantly improve over that. So we get um, a large improvement. Now I acknowledge that this is a different data set, which is much larger from Revit. So definitely there is benefit coming from the larger data set, um, but it's also the different representation, this learning in, um, of different word embeddings that are aware of the people behind um, in, in one shot. And also the benefit of this compositional word embeddings is that we can now compose them. So if we know about somebody that they are from um, say India, we know their gender and age, we can create a word embedding for say, a young female from India by composing them. And again, I'm emphasizing this because it's important without having access to any language from a particular user. Now here are results for gender. Um, again, the first line will show the results from the previous study that I shared and we see significant improvements with this, um, this model and for age, we haven't done that before. Um, so now we, uh, we just see the results from this study using um, the age grouping, how we can um, create embeddings and how well they predict the first response that one would provide. So now to conclude, um, I just want to share as a teaser, um, a way that we can use this kind of um, group specific word representations, um, humor generation. Um, we looked at the task of generating mad libs, um, which is a task that apparently is used quite often by children in US, um, where you would have a text and then you have some words that are blank. So the words in green here would typically not be shown to a user but you are given the property, what I'm showing here in, in red. So I would like to recommend my blank and you are told it's a female relative for the job of assistant blank and so forth. Um, so our hypothesis was that if we were to do this in a people aware um, way, it will result in more amusing mad libs. And so we went through a process, which I will not detail here, of selecting candidates, ranking them, and then completing the story with a focus on India and US as the two culture groups. Um, in the first um, component, we selected candidates um, using culture specific data. And in the second one, we filled in the candidates again using culture specific representations. And what we end up with 
um, just as simple as we see different fillers um, for different groups. And you will see here um, what we got for one sample text from India and US. So I will conclude with just ethical considerations and limitations, keeping in mind that what I share here is correlation, not causation. Uh, there are limitations coming from data distribution and coverage. We do not cover all gender identities, um, but I do believe that it's important to move in this direction of accounting for people behind the data, because otherwise the one size fits all models that we currently build are mostly reflective of the majority. Um, and data disaggregation is critical to building equitable models. Um, and I recommend this book, which has a lot of excellent uh, points as to how important it is to disaggregate data. Um, and with that, thank you for your attention. My final message is that language is not only about words, it is also about people. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor Mikhalsa. Uh, these social sciences questions are always uh, relevant to everyone. So let's switch to some uh, questions from the audience. Are there limitations on the kind of demographic groups that uh, can be considered with these approaches? Um, in theory, no. Um, in practice, of course, it always comes down to how much data you could collect. Again, being aware of the privacy of the user is something that we kept always in mind. So we do not go after data from individual users. Um, and so you could do any group to the extent that you would have enough data for that group. Um, otherwise, I, I cannot see of, of limitation other than it could be that for certain groups, there are really no differences. So it might not be worthwhile going this path. Um, but theoretically, you could try any, any grouping. And what about missing data? If uh, some of uh, the demographic labels are, uh, are unknown, uh, is, it a way, is there a way to, to avoid this, to get around it? Well, we've seen that. So I've shown like sometimes we do get for different dimensions unknown labels. And so far we handle them as such. And we actually see improvements even for unknowns. So which is an interesting question in itself. It could be that someone not reporting a certain identity is a, spe a specific of that group. They choose not to report. So that's a group mm -hmm. that we may even want to represent. Um, we can always make some predictions. I don't know if we want to go, to go that path to impute that missing value. Um, that's, that's always an option. Okay, and uh, uh, what about uh, ethics questions? Did you try, for example, you, you may try to use your model to learn demographic characteristic by the way someone is speaking. So uh, are there ethical uh, issues uh, about that? Well, it's always sort of sensitive ground. I think there is a trade-off, right? So on one side, you will say, well, I would want to do this disaggregation um, so that I can build better models. On the other, you could say, well, the disaggregation itself, is that something that you want to do to learn so characteristics of a certain group speaking? The view that I have is that we really have to consider the big picture when we make these decisions. We could decide not to disaggregate groups because of ethical considerations. And the effect of that could be that at the end of the day, the majority would benefit because the models are more fit to them and the minority will be losing. And so we really need to consider, I'm not saying I'm right or others are right, it's really consider the big picture and ethical considerations throughout, including on how a downstream application would affect different groups um, and make decisions with that in mind, as opposed to saying, I'm not gonna ever look at any demographic information um, because that's more ethical. And then eventually there will be groups of people harmed because the models just don't work well for them.